Precious metals move mostly sideways for the week. Silver looks to be closing around a dime less than a week ago, with silver spot ending around $14.23 per ounce. The gold spot price is around $1,224 an ounce in US dollar terms. This week's guest was last on our show about two months ago. One of the major topics of our discussion then and upcoming today revolves around the precious palladium market. The most bullish of all four major precious metals at the moment, the palladium spot price is up over $100 an ounce since we last spoke. This week's palladium spot price is closing a new nominal record price high of $1,185 an ounce. The terms record price and palladium may become highly synonymous ahead, especially if the supply demand factors we are about to discuss continue to help in discovering prices. Before we begin with our discussion and this week's guest, if you have any bullion stackers on your holiday shopping lists, make sure you have a look at Doc's holiday collection over at SD Bullion. Consider giving those you love precious presents that will last for years to come. Also keep your eye out for Nativity Scene and Santa Buck's fine silver foils or other blue sealed products, which will qualify your orders for free shipping. Hello and welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week is a returning guest, precious metal analyst and mining consultant, David Jensen of Jensen Strategic. This interview is being recorded at 12.30 p.m. Eastern on Friday, November 30th, 2018. David, on behalf of myself and our listeners, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Good morning, uh, James, and it's uh, it's good to be back with you. That's true. It is morning over in Vancouver. I'm speaking as if it's the afternoon here in the East Coast. But uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for coming back. Um, I'd like to start, you know, with your thoughts on perhaps the most technically and, and fundamentally bullish precious metal at the moment. Uh, that is palladium. Uh, it looks like it's you know hitting new nominal price highs virtually every day, and uh, it's only a few dollars away from the current gold price. Could you perhaps to begin, just because some of our listeners may not understand palladium nor its uh, supply demand fundamentals, could you give us just a brief over overview of what those are, and then we'll maybe move on to why the palladium price has been so bullish of late? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the palladium market is a really um, interesting market from from my standpoint. It's a, it's a microcosm of what's wrong with the metals markets in particular the london market which is supposed to be um, on the lbma is supposed to be a physical market so what, what we're seeing today james is is really a, a replay we've seen this once before uh, we saw it in 2000 um, the price spiked to 1180 uh, 11 or 1180 dollars per ounce in 2000 um, up from a hundred dollars an ounce in 1996 so it was, you know, almost 12 time uh, uh, run there. And uh, at the time, there was a, a real panic in, in London. Um, the the uh, six month lease rate had shot to uh, 300 uh, percent. Dresdner Bank was uh, begging the U.S. Uh, to release palladium from its strategic metals stockpile because they were at risk of going under. And it's interesting, you know, just kind of a, an aside here is, you know, the banks are so used to being bailed out that they, they do a, a bad trade or they issue unbacked uh, uh, paper um, contracts for metal and then they get into trouble and they demand, um, you know, it's a German bank demands the Americans to release metal to bail them out. So <laughs> it, these guys are continually you know, seeking gambling insurance uh, right. whenever they get into trouble, right? right. So, um, and, and what happened then was that uh, the Russians stepped in with their stockpiles. They had in round numbers about 25 million ounces at the time and essentially saved the London paper market. But the problem that they have in London, had in London then and that they still have today is the fact that they're trading these unallocated uh, paper contracts uh, for metal. And um, if people need uh, metal and you, all you have is contracts, um, then you've got a, a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, as long as the metal is flowing, you can set the price anywhere you want. Um, it's when people are looking to you as the world's primary uh, palladium market, which which London is, uh, when, when you run into trouble is when the metal starts to flow or has disrupt or stops flowing or has disruptions in the flow. Uh, at that point, you can offer 
as many of these unallocated uh, paper contracts as you want, um, but it, it does not work. Uh, the, the, the users of the metal want the metal. Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, it's auto, auto manufacturers. Uh, around 80% of the market is catalytic converter applications, and they're the ones uh, who, who are really scrambling for this metal now. So. Right. When you say catalytic uh, converter, basically it's just uh, palladium's added to the engines to basically stop uh, pollution, to, to, to stop uh, you know greenhouse gases, I suppose? Yeah, it's, it's a device that's put in the exhaust system. Mm -hmm. It's the first unit out of the engine um, in the exhaust train. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, the, the exhaust gases go through there and, and they uh, uh, um, address a, a nitrous oxide, uh, which causes smog, and they um, also uh, address the carbon monoxide issue, which is, is a poison for incomplete combustion. So mm -hmm. they're very important devices, and, and you can't ship automobiles uh, without these pollution control devices on them. Right. So... Um, I don't, do you want to take a look, a look now at the size of the market? Because I've just got some rough yeah. figures here just to scope it out. Yeah, that would help. Uh, okay, so in, in size, it's a small market. Um, the, the annual uh, consumption is, is of the order of uh, 10 million ounces a year. Uh, that's according to Reuters. They said they gave it a 10.2 million ounce uh, market size. And the deficit is estimated uh, this year at about 1.3 million ounces. So you take your mine supply, uh, you add into that your recycling supply, and then the remainder uh, between what you've got there in terms of your available metal and your consumption is your deficit, and that mm -hmm. has to be met from stockpiles. And this year it's of the order of about uh, 1.3 million ounces, according to uh, Reuters GFMS. So right. um, yeah, we have a you know, roughly a little over 10% um, deficit in the market. And, and Russia also is about 2.7%, or sorry, 2.7 uh, million ounces of mine supply a year. Mm -hmm. So when you add those two those two numbers together, you've got about 4 million ounces um, in terms of uh, questionable availability. Uh, around 40% of the market is, is in play. Right, and then South Africa as well is a major producer of palladium. I think they're on the order of something like 35% of the market supply. Um, That's right. So South Africa obviously isn't the calmest of places at the moment. So my hunch is uh, there's not going to be some huge spring of uh, production coming out of there. No, and, and the palladium that South Africa produces is a byproduct um, of, of platinum mm -hmm. uh, production. So, and I, as you know, the, I mean, there's a over $300 spread right now between the palladium and platinum prices. The platinum prices are falling. Right. So we, you know, and the other thing too that we've seen is, is looking at historic data. Um, James, I look back uh, to the UN export figures from Russia and their raw, um, unwrought or unworked um, palladium exports, you know, it's, it's interesting between 2013 and 2015, they only exported, well, they exported less than 50% of their mine supply. Hmm. So you're looking at, you know, three and three and a half to 4 million ounces that were not made available to the market from their mine supply at the time. And the other thing I found very interesting was that, um, there's no data presented. I couldn't find it anywhere for 2008 to 2011. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a sense of what they exported if they were holding back at that point. But what we can see right now is that the, with the price action and the lease rates in London, and also uh, you and I were just talking about the, uh, the net UK exports um, of palladium that we've seen here in the last few months that, you know, September they went from exporting, let's say on average about 100,000 an ounce, 100,000 ounces a month prior to about a 20,000 ounce net import. And it was about a 20% jump in the price. Mm -hmm in September and they've jumped another 20 some percent since then, right? It's been a 40% move. Right. So I, I think reading between the lines there that we can see that there's very little physical left in London, which is according to the former CEO of, of Johnson Matthew, that was where all of the world's primary uh, available Western uh, palladium stockpiles have been moved from Switzerland mm -hmm. um, between 2009 and 2013. So it looks to me like this market is dry and it's t very, very tight. Mm -hmm. And um, now we we uh, we look to Russia uh, for some consideration to save the, you know, the paper positions of the banks. And and I think that the stress 
will continue to increase um, because I I just don't see how, given the geopolitical situation and the continual agitation uh, of Russia by the West, and from my standpoint here, um, how they could continue to step in to really help out the, the London bullion banks. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, on your Twitter feed, uh, you do a lot of uh, tweets lately of uh, Palladium just because of the, how interesting the story is at the moment. You were uh, one of the tweets had the NYMEX warehouses of Palladium stocks, which are very, very tiny um, in, in, in general history. And then even the ETF, you can see the Palladium ETF, the amount of holdings of physical that are in either have been dwindling precipitously really since 2014, 2015 to today. Uh, so, yeah, it, it kind of falls in line with exactly what we're seeing, which is tightness in supply and uh, increasing prices. Yeah, the NYMEX is structured. The COMEX is not really structured as a physical market. If, if you, you you read their articles, um, the directors of the of the COMEX are allowed to intervene mm -hmm. and to force cash settlement if they deem it um, important. Mm -hmm. And what really for me is telling is looking at the registered stockpiles there. It's about the, the open interest, the total claims in the market is of the order of about 2.7 million ounces. I uh, checked a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. And the registered stocks in all 10 of the NYMEX vaults uh, is running about 18,000 ounces, right? So you've got hundreds of ounces of claims uh, per ounce that's available there. So it's not a, a, a physical metal market uh, the way London claims to be. Right, right. I was looking as well, you know, last time we had this discussion about palladium, it was in late September, and we both agreed the potential of price going up was was um, you know, obviously we thought it was the potential of going up was higher than it going down at the time, just given all the fundamentals we just mentioned. We had talked a little bit about the potentiality of platinum thrifting and you had uh, essentially said that it would be very, very difficult uh, to do that so quickly. And I have a quote here from late October from Raul Mittal. He's a uh, technical specialist um, of diesel after treatment at General Motors. He said at the uh, LBMA meeting in Boston um, just a few months ago, he said it's not a flick of a switch for us. Anytime you want to make a substitution like that, it's at least 18 months to a two-year cycle if we're going to switch. We have to be yeah. careful by the time we do all that, prices don't change or negate the benefits. So yeah. essentially, it's a, it's, a long, it's a long process if you do all of a sudden, you know, we have a gap here between platinum and palladium um, that's probably the widest we've seen in the uh, fiat currency era. I'm not sure prior, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. in the fiat currency era, this ratio is about as tight as it's been maybe since 2000, 2001. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it just basically speaks to the fact that, yeah, we could have a situation where the price of palladium goes lopsided to the upside here without any thrifting happening in the short term. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, one of the well, there's two things at play here is that there's a lot of people that appear to have had the, the, the pairs trade on of uh, long platinum and short palladium expo expecting the flip, right, to switch over and stop the consumption of palladium. Um, but I think what what really um, kind of arched my eyebrows when I read it was that uh, Goldman Sachs here about a week ago said their analyst, I think it was a week ago today, mm -hmm. uh, today's November 30, is that... A, Goldman Sachs, um, their analyst said that uh, the, that platinum is no substitute for palladium with the new high performance catalytic converters, which meet the stringent 2020 uh, environmental requirements. So I suspect what's happened in the last uh, week here is that there's been a rush to cover. I mean, uh, platinum last time I looked was about $800 an ounce or 803 something of that order, right. and uh, palladium was 1180, and it's they they really spread apart uh, markedly the last uh, week mm -hmm. and so I think that there's a realization and, and I did a little bit of research myself and indeed there's numerous research papers that identify that uh, palladium is the high performance material mm -hmm. for these type of pollution control devices and one other thing uh, James I, I just did a quick check um, with one of the banks in Toronto uh, today and the lease rates of palladium have surged today up to 12 and a half percent on the one month and to 12 percent on the three month versus in round numbers about 9.8 percent 
uh, and 9.5% for the two respectively um, about uh, actually yesterday. So we're, we're seeing a spiking here in, in the lease rate indicating an acceleration of the shortage. And I, I think that there's we're going to see now where the market values palladium. Yeah. Up until now, we've seen where the bullion banks value it. Mm-hmm. And with the with the chokehold of London on the physical market, and then by taking away the NYMEX as a uh, as a relief valve uh, for the activities of, of uh, London, we've really had a mispricing of these very essential assets and and a complete distortion of the of the production profile uh, globally of platinum and palladium. Mm-hmm. Um, more than half of the pla- of the African mines are are on a cash basis losing money mm-hmm. right now every day they operate they lose money and um, that's a consequence of the mispricing and it's the unallocated unbacked paper contracts in the world dominant uh, PGM or platinum group metals market in London at the LBMA um, uh, which is driving this distortion in the price yeah. and if you did not have the if you did not have the unallocated contract structure uh, you would not be able to uh, to swing prices and distort them for such a long uh, period of time yeah i mean that kind of goes back to the the mantra that you know eventually all manipulations especially in commodities they eventually fall apart because you know low prices beget higher prices eventually because you know if you have artificial low prices that means people aren't making money from pulling it out of the ground and eventually that means the supply will dwindle and therefore the price must go higher to meet the demand yeah. so uh, this is um, this is great because it's the timing is excellent it's it's really perfect because it coincides with the LBMA transparency push and uh, you know they've been out there on using their big megaphone talking about how transparent they're going to be with uh, all their data etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know I, I, I try not to be such a cynic, but I mean, it, when you dive down their transparency data and you start looking at what they've been publishing and I mean, the, there's just so many questions unanswered. And of course, you yourself have uh, directly asked these questions to them and um, I'm sure gotten no response. I believe GATA.org has also been doing the same. And, um, you know, Ronan Manley over at Bullion Star has been a hawk on uh, LBMA transparency push, and he's done really good work as far as describing um you know what a deceptive uh push this has really been in in the sense that uh it's not really transparent at all it's just a buzzword uh i I mean you may have some thoughts on what the what they've been up to i I suppose i'd like to hear those yeah it's i mean ronan uh ronan manley has done just a fantastic job he's very rigorous in the research he does so it's i just want to give a hat tip to him right now for that Mm -hmm. Uh, he's been an important contributor um so the overall the the palladium market as i mentioned is a microcosm of those other markets and the problem is that they continue to trade these unallocated contracts and you know in 20 in 2011 uh the lbma came out with their london um, local london liquidity survey and said oh we trade uh 10 times uh, turnover our turnover is 10 times the net settled value that we post on our website every day meaning that the that the trade between the parties uh, there is 10 times larger than people see when they see the net settled. Net settled is, you know, if I owe you 10 and and, and, uh, and you owe me nine, we're just post one uh, contract at the end of the day is the net trading. Right. And so what we find here is that uh, there's 10 times the post uh, volume and we have no idea what it is in platinum and palladium. Now, a week on November 20th, the LVMA came out and said, oh, well, we're actually trading 1.5 times the net settled, right? So in 2011, it was 10 times. Um, now it's 1.5 times and no further information. Um, trust us. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I just, I, I'm just astounded. Um, but I think that Palladium is going to give us some, some real insights into this market because yeah. of how small it is and the hand waving doesn't work when you have this type of situation where it's a critical asset Mm -hmm. needed to keep auto plants open. Yeah. And um, And just a point on that. I mean, the U S government has strategic minerals and and metals. They have a report that they publish every year. And uh, the, the platinum metals group is on that report. And it, it, it says basically that the platinum metals group is essential to national security and our economy. 
So it's um, mm-hmm. this is not like uh, some you know some you know non important metal. This is uh, absolutely critical for us to be able to drive automobiles and not pollute the world. So uh, yeah. it's um, it, we're definitely at a at a very interesting moment uh, when it comes to uh, the platinum metals group. Uh, especially with palladium, the way it's breaking out in price. So, um, you know, it's yeah. going to be it's going to be very very interesting to see where it goes, and uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing more uh, more exposure to real price discovery, maybe in the in the months and years to come. Yeah, I, I think we'll see it. And I, I thought that the, the Russia Today, uh, I mean, that's the Russian state news agency, and they had an article they posted earlier this week, and it was uh, it was to the effect that. You know, is palladium worth more than gold, and and why is Russia smiling? Mm-hmm. And you know, I really I took that as a troll mm-hmm. uh, that they were trolling the LBMA because I mean, they they know they've got these guys this time, and that you know we're going to see now. I think a a correction in the market and a reset of the price, uh, and of course it'll overshoot to the upside um, uh, as long as it's not like a, a major economic crash where we lose you know 50 60 percent of our automobile demand but mm-hmm. you know that the shortage is today right and and economic crashes seldom happen overnight i mean it'd be the first time ever but i guess it could happen but i think we're going to see now what happens when paper meets metal demand mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know metal beats paper every time mm-hmm. and uh, i just don't know uh how the banks are going to wriggle out of this this one this time, mm-hmm. and and I and I think it's interesting too that the the new transparency push by the LBMA. I mean, they, they announced it uh, November twentieth, what their trading volume was, uh, the ratio was between net settled and and, um, and turnover, and, and they announced it like three weeks beforehand that they were going to release it, and they announced it at a conference in the, in the U.S. and nothing was really posted on their website about it, so. It looks to me like they're seeing the same problems that we're seeing, mm-hmm. and there's kind of a rush to, to a rush to come clean here. So, mm-hmm. but we'll see we'll see what happens. Speaking of uh, market rigging and uh, practices uh, to trying to manipulate markets, um, I wanted to switch gears perhaps to kind of close out the interview and talk to you about what happened this past week with uh, Jay Powell, the Fed Federal Reserve Chairman. Um, there was. He was uh, talking about, uh, you know, the setting of interest rates and uh, questions of whether or not they were going to continue to raise or perhaps they were going to pause. Uh, he talked about, um, you know, that the interest rates that they're setting their policy were just below neutral now, whereas only a month ago he claimed that they were still a long way from that point. Uh, and then, of course, the stock market saw that as dovish uh, speak and uh, it popped up in a short term bounce upward. Um, given the idea that you know perhaps they'll get some more support to help uh, help stock pri- stock and equity prices, I just wonder in the grand scope of things, w- what is your take on this? What what are you thinking in terms of uh, you know the Federal Reserve and, and what they're up to? Yeah, I mean the Federal Reserve. Um, what I think what has really done extreme damage um, to the U.S. economy. I mean it's not just the last forty years of, of declining interest rates. Um, um, down to zero percent, uh, while the price of gold has been shut down in London. Um, and, and by the way, the London bullion market was created by the Bank of England. Um, you know, so you know, creating the paper market and disconnecting the demand of metal, uh, demand for metal, from interest rates. We we know that in 1980, um, real interest rates went to plus nine percent, so nine percent above the price of inf- uh, above the rate of inflation to bring. Uh, investors back into bonds out of gold when they had run such loose monetary policy for the Vietnam War and other things. So, um, but what we see right now is that the damage has been done by reducing interest rates to zero percent, and uh, for such a long period, um, running running it for seven eight years. And what it does is is it it creates consumption which is not supported by the productivity of your economy. And secondly, what it does is builds in a dependency on on low interest rates and essentially free money in the economy. And then to raise interest rates after a prolonged prolonged time like that is going to have a precipitous impact on the economy. And I I think if if we look at that uh, true money supply uh, dash two, which is the broad measure, and that's something that's posted on uh, Acting Man. Uh, but it's a very, very useful uh, measure. Uh, what it measures is all cash that's available 
um, in the economy or in the banks um, that's checkable. So there's no time delay. There's no 30, 60 day hold on it. Mm -hmm. And that reflects the very liquid money supply. And we can see on that graph, I don't know if you can pull it up, James, but yeah. what we can see on it is that every, the, the last two times that they, uh, as the economy has become more and more debt dependent over the last couple of decades, if they've reduced the year over year growth to the 5% or lower range, it's precipitated a crisis. And uh, or a, a market uh, bubble collapse. You know, the dot com bubble in, in 2001 was collapsed, mm -hmm. and the housing bubble in 2008 and on was collapsed. And that came 12 to 18 months subsequent to tightening of that of that money supply. And that makes sense when you've got a credit dependent economy as they've created now. Is that uh, you know with a debt based monetary system, um, you choke off uh, the availability of debt, and you're not going to be able to service the existing debt there and to fuel the the uh, uh, unsupportable consumption which has uh, come about as a consequence of the low interest rates right so now they've done it again as you can see there we, we've uh, you know 18 months beginning of 2017 they started to uh, precipitously lower interest rates again and and um, what we expect to see with the Austrian economic view of this is that there's been a choke off of the flow of credit into the market and that these um, uh, years, combined years of Bernanke and Yellen uh, loose money is now going to come home to roost, and uh, it's going to be a very, very uncomfortable period. Yeah, I've been watching um, you know various videos, and you know we, we we're looking at a situation where you know we have a huge amount of unfunded liabilities overhanging in the United States. I think uh, uh, Professor Kotlikoff he estimates the net present value of those unfunded liabilities and debt that the U.S. has over two hundred trillion dollars. Uh, you know, so over the long haul, I mean, the the question is, okay, well, how are they going to default on that? Because they're not going to be able to pay that off with the GDP of twenty twenty trillion roughly per year. So I guess the the idea is you're going to probably have a combination of defaults versus uh, dollar debasement long term. Um, the other the other question I suppose was um, it's basically we're looking at a situation now where the Federal Reserve has roughly three point eight trillion dollar balance sheet, and you have a situation of unfunded liabilities staring at you in the face in the next ten twenty years, as well as uh, unfunded uh, pension plans. You know there are a lot of pension plans that are underfunded. Uh, so you have a stock market that's potentially going to roll over. What is going to be the uh, response to that? And, uh, you know, Raul Paul, who is the founder of Real Vision, he uh, he believes that in the next crisis, the Federal Reserve will reverse course and essentially double their balance sheet up to eight trillion, essentially doing what Japan did uh, by going outright and just buying stocks and uh, propping up the, the stock market. And, you know, if anyone knows anything about Japan, there was a mega bubble there in the late 80s. And ever since they've been, you know, propping up the stock market, et cetera, it's never reached the, the nominal highs that it was in the late 80s. Uh, and now the Japanese central bank, you know, they own a huge, huge swath of the ETF market and, and, and various stocks outright. So it, it, it gives the impression that, yeah, OK, the Federal Reserve may do that, uh, but that doesn't mean we're going to go into another bubble as far as uh, equity prices and values. It may just simply be to, to kind of him the tide, I suppose, uh, is, is yeah. basically what his point was. Well, I, the, the, the Federal Reserve is founded upon a, a, a central deception. And the central, the key element here to accept, um, in order to accept the idea of central banking, is that you can create real growth from printing money. And once you accept that, you can go through all kinds of papers and, and complex uh partial differential equations and all this stuff and come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. But if you distill it down, the central point there is that you can't create real growth from printing money. And so you're, you've got to continually print money to maintain an appearance of growth. But as we know, we've got very, very high uh, consumer goods inflation and, and all kinds of economic bubbles around us. So if the, if the Fed responds with more printing, uh, I'm not sure this is going to be a Japanese-style re re response. Um, the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. Um, and the fact is that the Japanese embarked on their multi-decade uh, policy at a time where the rest of the world's economy was, uh, although it became increasingly ill, it was relatively uh, well or not nearly as distorted as it is now. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I just, uh, we'll see what happens here. They, they will try to print. There's no question. These are money printers. That's mm-hmm. what they do. As Bobber says, these are the money printers. And the money printing is the key to their deception that they can uh, create growth from nothing. And if you take it, uh, the extension of that would be that if you can create growth from nothing by printing money, then why does anybody ha- ever have to work? Right. <laughs> right? It's kind of like, well, let's just print money then. Let's just sit back and have a good time. Yeah. Right? So, so this, there's going to be questions raised if they embark on further emergency uh, monetary policy. There's still, uh, in round numbers, about three and a half trillion bucks on the balance sheet of the Fed. And uh, we're still experiencing emergency monetary policy because that balance sheet hasn't gone to zero yet. Mm -hmm. So they never got done with the first round. Now it works so well, they're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. Uh, It'd be interesting interesting to hear what the argument is for that of why you want to embark on a failed policy again. So it it may be that we just see the end of the Fed. Um, I think more and more people... It's not you and I, James. Uh, there are rafts of people out there who are just asking the question that they've never asked before, that they're looking at this with a lens of view that's outside of what they were taught in university economics, mm-hmm. uh, which is how the, how how in the world can you guys think that you can do this and maintain any kind of a semblance of growth and, and not destroy the market economy? And maybe that's the point. Maybe the market economy is really the target here. But um uh, you know, I think there's going to be an uproar uh, as people realize that these are, this is the, one of the greatest deceptions. Yeah, I think uh, it was John Exeter once who said that this is the, you know, in the broad scope of things, Federal Reserve is the greatest, um, you know, that the financial markets are like a crime and punishment uh, type of situation and that the Federal Reserve is essentially has been running the, the largest crime of all time and therefore the punishment uh, the end result, the aggregate punishment will be the largest of all time as well. So The Fed is a creator of economic bubbles and for the banks, and then it stands in place as they call it the lender of last resort, but it's 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 gambling insurance. Mm-hmm. And so the Fed stands there, they've they've got the back of the banks, the banks gamble and they make and it's the old, you know, uh, head, heads I heads I keep the, the gains and, and tails you you bail me out. <laughs> right. right? And so it's a it's a never lose, and it also allows you know it was put in place for World War One, and, and World War One occurred, and it, they had the deficit financing there because they could print, and then we had the 1920 bubble, twenties bubble, and they chopped off the monetary supply, and it created the depression, and they took gold out of the monetary system. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a it, from my point of view here, it's a thoroughly corrupt institution, and it's founded on a key deception of that you can print money and create real growth, and that. That's not true. There must be another reason for it to be there. And, and the reason is that it allows massive deficit spending. And number two, it allows fun times for the financial institutions who are the shareholders of the regional banks in the Fed and provides gambling insurance for them. So wow. they've always they've always got a positive, rosy outlook no matter what the market is. All right. Well, I don't want to end on such a, uh, a negative tone. Let's uh, let's swing it back for a, a final cap. Um, you know, obviously, the palladium situation, I think, is looking extremely bullish. I think we both agree that uh, there's going to be some possible fireworks there coming up. Yep. Is there a way that uh, people can follow you, David? Uh, how can they uh, hear your thoughts real time? Well, I, I try to post fairly regularly on Twitter, uh, real David Jensen with no spaces. It's a uh, real David and then J E N S E N, um, on Twitter. Uh, I, I think that the palladium, uh, market, uh, correction here, a correction to the upside, um, is, is not going to be, uh, in isolation from the rest of the precious metals market. And I think that's one reason that so many people are interested in following this is that, the other markets as well have very large um, uh, unallocated claims in them, and I I I believe that the markets that the knock on here is going to be into platinum and silver next, which are the next tightest markets in terms of claims versus above ground available stocks, and then ultimately gold as well. So I don't know if they all go in union or if it's in sequence, mm-hmm. uh, orderly sequence, or if it just uh, goes up in a whoosh it's very difficult to tell but the key issue here is unallocated metal is meeting physical demand and um yeah i'll keep posting on on uh, real david jensen on twitter and monitor the markets and hopefully provide insight that people can't get from other sources 
Well, David, on behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you so much for coming back. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on in a little bit to uh, discuss the markets and uh, metals. My pleasure, James, and thank you for your time. 